Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Vesna Mihailovich. I'm one of the echocardiography fellows here at St. Mike's. And today's topic will be um, how we evaluate prosthetic valves in the lab. Okay, so the objectives for our talk will be to briefly discuss early and late complications of valve replacement, just so we know what we're looking for on the echo, to provide a differential diagnosis for high peak velocities across prostheses to provide you with an approach to evaluating aortic and mitral uh, prosthetic obstruction and regurgitation with a more focus on the obstruction part, uh, to discuss what patient prosthesis mismatch is and what its consequences are, and we'll go over two cases throughout the presentation. So the main guidelines that uh, you will see referenced in the talk are the 2009 ASC guidelines for the evaluation of prosthetic valves, as well as uh, the 2019 um, guidelines for evaluation of regurgitation uh, in percutaneous uh, valves. So first off, what, or what complications are we looking for on the echo? Paravalvular leak is uh, one of the early complications we look for on our uh, echoes pre-discharge. Uh, Paravalvular leak is more common if the patient has had a lot of calcium in the area, if they're an older age, or if they had an aortic re uh, reconstruction. Uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, early prosthetic thromboembolism. This is a rare complication, but it can occur if the patient is inadequately anticoagulated or there is a coagulopathy um, that the patient uh, has and we didn't know about it. Uh, acute infective endocarditis is uh, rare and, and occurs in less than 1% of cases. Some late complications. Uh, thrombosis is uh, more common as a late complication compared to an early complication. And it's more common in mechanical valves uh, for obvious reasons. Panis ingrowth is also something we see more in mechanical valves, but it can occur in both uh, bioprosthetic uh, and mechanical, as can thrombosis. Valve degeneration uh, leading to stenosis and regurgitation is something we see more commonly with bioprosthetic valves and specific risk factors are sort of being of a young age, having renal failure. Hemolytic anemia and dishiscence uh, are other complications with hemolytic anemia not requiring much of um, regurgitation to, to be quite pronounced. And then of course, infective endocarditis which in prosthetic valves usually starts around the ring. Um, and then you can also on top of that have uh, complications including abscess uh, plus minus fistula. So the five uh, sort of what I consider essential components of a prosthetic valve evaluation uh, are listed here. One, we want to determine the prosthesis type and size, and you'll see why this is important uh, later on in the talk. We'll use our 2D echo to evaluate the prosthesis, uh, specifically its um, you know, stability, uh, position, and, and leaflet motion. Uh, we'll look toward our color Doppler and spectral Doppler to obtain relevant gradients. We'll then sort of review all of these findings as a collective and try and explain any discrepancies that we see. And then we'll look at the old echo to see if there has been a change over time. So step one is determining the prosthesis type and size, which of course we get from uh, our OR reports. Uh, Dr. Rahim Tula was a, a physician who published on uh, patient prosthesis mismatch and really, um, hit, you know, it, it sort of summarizes why it is so important for us to know what type of valve and the size that we're dealing with. He quotes, the devices used for valve replacement have not been perfect. They have introduced other new problems into clinical medicine so that in effect, the patient is exchanging one disease process for another. And really all that means is that no hemodynamic profile of a prosthetic valve is perfect. Um, so you're always leaving the patient with some degree of dysfunction. Our job in the echo lab is to sort of know what degree of dysfunction falls within the normal range for that particular prosthesis. All prosthetics have different hemodynamic profiles according to their type and size. And there are Doppler-derived hemodynamic profiles that have been published for normal valve prostheses. 
And so we refer to them uh, for, for um, our normative values. The ASC 2009 um, guidelines that I referenced to at the beginning of the talk in their appendix have a table that provides you with a number of different valve types and their sizes. And with that, you can then determine what the normal sort of peak mean peak and mean gradient as well as effective orifice area should be. Now, just to go back to this slide for a second, as a general rule of thumb, you can think of most valves resembling mild aortic stenosis. That's where their gradients will fall. However, that rule of thumb does not We apply to scentless or homo rafts because they tend to mimic more uh, normal valves. And so the types of valves that I just referred to, we are all mostly familiar with. We have bioprosthetic valves that can be scented, so they're on a sitting on frame or scentless. I'll show you pictures in a moment. Percutaneous and then mechanical valves uh, nowadays are usually by leaflet, and then older versions are single tilting disc or caged ball. So we'll just have a look at what normal uh, valves uh, look like in this case on TEE simply because we just get uh, better resolution and we can appreciate uh, re physiologic regurgitation um, on TEE. Of course, in TTE, we get a lot of shadowing in the LA from the prosthesis, so we can't appreciate it as well. So in the middle column here, we have uh, diastole and in the last column, we have systole. So over here, you can nicely see um, sort of acoustic shadowing from the occluders. Uh, tilting disc here, uh, caged ball here. When we look at uh, what physiologic regurgitation looks like, there's sort of two main mechanisms. One, there's either truly true regurgitation just at the hinge point. So in this case, we see one, two, three jets because they're sort of three uh, hinge points. Or we get more as the occluder closes, we get sort of a displacement of volume um, with that closure, and so we can see uh, a single jet in the case of uh, the tilting disc and cage ball uh, valve types. These are examples of bioprosthetic valves. The first one here is a stented valve. As you can see, when we look at uh, it on echo, you can appreciate that the stent is a bit more echo dense, but the leaflets should be in a normal valve nice and thin. It's very difficult without, sometimes without knowing uh, that you're looking at a stentless uh, valve or just a normal native valve uh, as shown here. And again, uh, appreciate that the leaflets are thin. You may see a little more um, kind of thickening around the annulus, just consistent either with post-op changes or potentially an abscess. So clinical context, of course, plays a key part there. And then this is just a, one example of a percutaneous valve um, where we are really attuned to uh, identifying paravalvular leak. And in this example, there is a small uh, jet right there. Okay, so once we've determined our prosthesis, prosthesis size and type, we can move on to looking at what it looks like on 2D echo. The key features, oh, my videos are not playing. The key features that we uh, should be looking for our motion of the leaflets in bioprosthetic valves and occluders in uh, mechanical valves, whether we see any uh, leaflet calcification or abnormal densities, uh, what the valve sewing ring integrity looks like, meaning do we see any separation or rocking motion. Here uh, I have uh, put in two uh, videos. One is showing you um, the, the aortic valve. Here you can see nicely that the leaflets are moving, but they look a little bit thick compared to what we would anticipate normal to look like. That thickness though is not as bright as the, uh, the stent of the valve. And that's an important um, observation that we'll talk more about later. In this case, again, a different patient, and you can see how the, leaflet here is quite restricted in its mobility and its brightness is almost the same as the leaflet stent. Uh, 
So oftentimes when we see something, some kind of thickness or something on the valve leaflets, we have to somewhat decide whether we're probably seeing thrombus or whether we're probably seeing panis. And panis is just a fibrous ingrowth on the valve. Clinical context, of course, helps us uh, decide which one it may be. If the patient presented more acutely, it's more likely a thrombus. Um, but the key features that I've already alluded to uh, somewhat uh, are shown here for the, that help us decide what we're looking at. Thrombus tends to be a bit more larger than panis. It is less echo-dense um, than uh, panis. It tends to be more mobile and it uh, tends to project above the surgical ring line, meaning that it protrudes into the left atrium. <clears throat> whereas uh, panis tends to sort of kind of not protrude as much. Uh, and of course, uh, thrombus is more common in mitral valves uh, versus panis in uh, aortic valves. Now we often, the, the, those examples up in the last slide were mechanical valves, but both of these complications can occur in bioprosthetic valves. And uh, as you notice, these pictures are the ones that I showed you in that, um, initial slide where, where we really appreciate that the stent is more echo dense than the thrombus on this valve. And from the pathological sense, you can actually see that more, most often the thrombus tends to sort of spare the, the very uh, free edges of the cusp. So that's why we see them move generally normally. They just look a bit thicker in certain views. Okay, so we'll move on to color Doppler and spectral Doppler, and we'll first focus on the aortic valve. So the parameters that we can obtain uh, from color and spectral Doppler are peak velocity, peak gradient, mean gradient, and of course we want to actually obtain the maximal gradient. So that's why uh, it's very important to obtain, you know, all your different views, consider using the blind probe, getting the patient in the right lateral position, all those things to try and bring out the highest gradient possible. We will look at the contour of the jet velocity. Uh, we'll uh, go over what acceleration time is and, and sort of how it helps us. We'll go over the dimensional valve index and how that helps us. Uh, we will proceed to estimate the orifice area by the continuity equation. And then we can compare what we get through our echo based on those reference values I alluded to earlier in order to see if we are in the normal range for that valve or not. And then we'll also assess for the presence, location, and severity of regurgitation. So the first important uh, concept to understand is that a high peak velocity or mean gradient alone is not proof of an obstruction and we'll go over what exactly the differential is for a high mean gradient. Along the same lines, a low peak velocity or mean gradient is not proof of the absence of a pathologic obstruction because in the setting of a very low stroke volume, for example, you may not see uh, a high mean gradient. So we'll now go over that differential for uh, a high Vmax or mean gradient across the valve. In general, we can have pathologic obstruction from thrombus, panis, valve degeneration, or in some cases, a large vegetation. We can have functional obstruction, either from uh, like a pressure recovery phenomenon, which we'll talk about momentarily, or patient prosthesis mismatch, which we'll also talk about in subsequent slides. We can have significant regurgitation giving us a high stroke volume and um, thus these high uh, velocities. Um, or we can have another reason for having a high flow state, thyrotoxicosis, an AV fistula, for example, um, sepsis, and, and that's why we're, we're seeing the higher uh, uh, velocities and gradients. Or it can be in some cases normal, depending on, you know, if you, if you look at the valve and indeed the, the normative uh, Doppler-derived values fit the hemodynamics. Um, this is just to remind you that uh, flow, uh, kind of what our gradient is proportional to, and it's flow and the EOA. Okay, 
So we'll now take a deep breath and try and go over pressure recovery. I know Fodi uh, went through this last week, but it's never uh, too much. Uh, you can never go through it too much because it's one of those concepts that takes a, a, a few times to listen to and wrap your head around. So uh, in essence, in order for us to get blood from the ventricle and to the rest of the body, the ventricle has to generate some mechanical energy, which then the blood will convert to kinetic energy and thus move. But as, and that kinetic energy is highest at the vena contracta or the, what we, where we measure our EOA. As the blood moves beyond the vena contracta and into the ascending aorta, some of that energy is lost as thermal energy and or some is recovered as this concept of pressure recovery. Now, how much energy is converted to thermal energy and how, how much pressure recovery we get is a bit of a, a we don't exactly know, but the, the, the most important determinant that we think uh, sort of is at play is the ratio between the valve EOA and the aortic cross-sectional area. Uh, and with the higher ratio uh, leading to more pressure recovery. Such that if you have two patients and they have the same valve, they have the same stroke volume, they have the same EOA, if one of them has a very small aorta, but the other one has a larger aorta, the one with the smaller one will have more pressure recovery compared to the one with the larger one will not really have much. And the reason this concept is important is because if we look at the uh, peak gradient diff sort of uh, that we obtain, the instantaneous gradient between the LVOT and at that vena contracta spot, we're going to get a higher gradient than if we look at the gradient between the LVOT and a spot up here in the proximal ascending aorta. So that in essence, echo will overestimate um, the gradient compared to cath. And so what's the true gradient, you might ask? Well, the amount of energy that your LVOT has to generate is really, um, to, in order to overcome the valve stenosis, is really more representative of that gradient between the LVOT and the, the aorta rather than the one at the EOA. So that's why it's sort of hemodynamically more relevant to the patient uh, measuring this particular gradient. So when do we have to really think about pressure recovery? Usually in small aortas where the sinotubular junction is less than three centimeters and sometimes in small bileaflet mechanical valves because if you recall there's that central um, kind of orifice and it's much smaller than the, the two uh, orifices that are on the side. And so the smaller orifice tends to overestimate um, the EOA. Now, one might ask, how can we tell on echo if we are dealing with a pressure recovery situation or something else? It's often hard to tell, but uh, there is this concept of calculating an energy loss index with the formula shown here. So essentially what you do is you obtain your um, AVA uh, the usual way, okay? And then you obtain an aortic uh, cross-sectional area. So in this example, our diameter is 2.5 centimeters, and we use this formula to obtain the area. And then we plug in all those numbers into this energy loss index equation. And that sort of gives us a kind of an EOA that's more based on uh, what we would expect at that ascending aorta pressure gradient rather than at the vena contracta. And this has been studied somewhat, uh, you know, in a few different studies now, and they've noticed that you can actually reclassify people who were thought to be severe based on their AVA, but once you calculate their energy loss index, so let's say that a patient has an AVA of 0 0.5 centimeters per meter squared, and they have a very small aorta that's, you know, two centimeters, we're being uh, drastic, then really their ELI is more in the 
moderate range, 0.7, rather than a severe range. And so, and they actually do um, have prognostic data now suggesting that they, they, these patients do well up to four years or so. Okay, so we'll now move on uh, from all things gradients to the contour of the jet velocity. Oh, I think I missed a slide. Nope. Okay. So in a normal valve, oh, we did miss a slide. That's interesting. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so in a normal valve, the, the normal jet should be a bit more triangular shaped uh, and early peaking versus in an obstructed valve, you'll see more of a rounded contour and a mid ejection uh, peaking. The acceleration time is really a continuation of this concept. So if we measure the acceleration time, which is essentially the start of the ejection to the peak of the ejection, and we obtain an acceleration time of less than 80, that's normal. 80 to 100 is sort of the gray zone, and then over 100 suggests obstruction. So now to go over how we estimate our effective orifice area. So for the, this is largely for the C1s who are new to the concept. So by continuity equation or the Bernoulli principle, we know that um, we are going to have flow on this side and this side that's essentially equal. And the way we can estimate flow uh, coming from the LV or the LV stroke volume is, that, is by pretending that that volume is a cylinder. If we obtain the cross-sectional area of the uh, LVOT by using our pi r squared equation, and then we multiply that by the VTI, which is essentially the height of the cylinder, we can obtain the stroke volume, and then divide that stroke volume by the VTI obtained um, with the CW over the prosthesis, sorry about the noise, we're just having construction here, um, to obtain our effective orifice area. Now it's important to consider what potential errors you can introduce here, uh, which can really change your effective orifice area calculation. So if we incorrectly measure the LVOT by making it, let's say, falsely large, we can increase our stroke volume and therefore increase our EOA. The opposite will happen if we make our LVOT diameter very small. We are supposed to be now measuring the LVOT just beneath the sort of, just under the base of the valve. Another important thing is to be mindful of where you are putting your sample volume to obtain your PW, because if you are, um, if you place it a little bit too closely, that will obviously amplify your VTI and will give you a falsely uh, large EOA. Lastly, as mentioned earlier, it's important to obtain the ma that max gradient um, uh, across the prosthesis itself. So exploring all the different views is important. Now, another important concept and one, you know, sometimes the surgeons might come and say, hey, how come, you know, I know the EOA I've put in, the, the EOA, the sort of uh, the geometric orifice area of the valve that I put in is so, but whatever EOA you're getting by echo is a bit smaller. So that's actually expected because we obtain our EOA at a slightly higher than what the GOA is. And due to the sort of valve geometry, it does actually, uh, it is actually a bit smaller. The other important thing to be mindful of is that the annular diameter of the valve that you see when you you know you see someone had a you know magna number 21 the 21 is this diameter not the internal diameter okay so now we'll go on a little bit of a tangent and talk about patient prosthesis mismatch so as mentioned earlier the gradient is uh, proportional to flow um, and so in order for us to maintain a low gradient, we have to have an EOA that is proportional to the furl requirements of the patient. 
And at rest, most of our flow requirements are determined by our body size, such that what, when we have a patient prosthesis mismatch, that usually happens when we've implanted a valve that's too small for the patient's body size or essentially DSA. All right, so we can easily, usually easily avoid this problem uh, by simply being mindful of, of the patient, like what, what the patient's annulus is, and then using these uh, handy charts to decide on what our expected uh, indexed EOA will be post-op. Now, if we anticipate that we can't, that we will have a, a, some patient prosthesis mismatch, there are all sort of things we can do about that. We can do an aortic root enlargement, or we can consider implanting uh, certain valves that are stentless that will give us a little more uh, space. In, in any case, it seems that moderate PPM is not that uncommon. Uh, severe is fairly uncommon. And one would then argue that moderate PPM might be fairly reasonably tolerated. But it's not a good thing to have because uh, studies have shown that it, it leads to reduced uh, short-term and long-term survival. Additionally, patients who have um, PPM tend to have less improvement in their symptoms and functional class. This is uh, in the setting of the aortic valve, our cutoffs that we use. So for severe um, PPM, we use a cutoff of 0 0.65 uh, in normal weight patients uh, and 0 0.6 in obese patients. Now, sometimes we get into a situation where either we can't get a good measurement of the LVOT, or we are in a situation where we have lots of flow across the valve. And in that case, the DVI can be very helpful um, because it's not dependent on the LVOT measurement and it shouldn't be affected on, under high flow conditions. A normal DVI in, for the aortic valve is 0 0.3 and then uh, below 2 point, 0 0.25 suggests some stenosis. So this is a nice summary chart of it provided in the guidelines that can help you keep all these numbers um, straight uh, and provides a good reference for when you are uh, looking at uh, studies with prosthetic valves and possible obstruction. The only thing to be mindful of is that it does not up to homographs stent valves and percutaneous uh, prostheses because they have uh, slightly different flow dynamics, more consistent with native valves. The guidelines also provide a nice algorithm uh, that uh, reiterates the concepts we just discussed. Um, it's important that when you get into a situation where there seems to be a discrepancy uh, between your findings, so for example, in this case, we have a DVI that's essentially normal, uh, but an acceleration time that looks quite curved, uh, sorry, the contour looks curved, but the, an acceleration time is quite high. In that case, what you may be dealing with is that you've uh, overestimate, overestimated your DVI for some reason, meaning you've made a measurement error or somewhere along the way. If we look at the formula, we can kind of um, reason through what the problem might be. So if we increase the velocity of, of the LVOT, meaning make the numerator bigger, we will make the DVI bigger. And the way we can do that, do that is by bringing our PW a little too close to the valve. Uh, similarly, uh, if we obtain a submaximal gradient, uh, a CW across the valve, uh, we'll end up with the same um, sort of problem. If, uh, we fall in the middle here, then we'll just follow our, our little diagram and get to a point where we are either dealing with a normal valve, potentially a pressure recovery situation if the gradient is very high, and then we can use our EOA to sort of help us decide um, what the problem is. Is it more that we're in a high flow situation or that we are dealing with a, a PPM situation? Here we're obviously in that uh, prosthesis stenosis area. And then again here, we are in a discrepancy area where we have 
normal contour, normal uh, acceleration time, but a low DVI. And again, you want to be conscientious that you haven't placed that PW sample a little too apically in this case. I'll quickly go over regurgitation because it's uh, to almost a topic uh, on its own, but it is fairly commonly seen in practice. Um, obviously, when it comes to um, mechanical valves, it can be difficult to actually see uh, your regurgitant jets uh, due to shielding and reverberations. It can also be difficult to sort of track the course of the jet, especially if it's eccentric. The guidelines do, excuse me, do provide a nice um, diagram. This is actually from the um, ASC echocardiography formula review uh, guide uh, as to kind of in what view you are seeing, uh, what part of the valve you are seeing so that you can make a comment on where the regurgitation is coming from. Um, and just, it's important to note that, for example, in your perispernal long axis view, you're actually not seeing every part of the valve. And so in order to really assess for paravalvular leak, you have to look at uh, sort of all of its sides. The guidelines uh, for how we grade um, prosthetic uh, aortic valve regurgitation is really not very different from what we usually do. The only difference in this version of the guidelines is that we don't have the vena contracta and they were uh, omitted um, because of the technical challenges of measuring it. That is uh, not the case though once we got into the prosthetic um, regurgitation, like prosthetic valve regurgitation guidelines where um, the vena contracta is actually included. We also can uh, look at the circumferential extent of the regurgitation. So if we calculate, if we obtain a circumference for the valve and then obtain a circumference of, not circumference, but I guess the length of the regurgitation uh, vena contracta, then we can sort of get a percentage and there are cutoffs provided for what's mild, moderate, and severe. The cutoffs are different in the two guidelines. Um, so these ones are the ones for the uh, prosthetic guidelines. And then in the prosthetic guidelines, we also have the vena contracta area, uh, which we don't have in the older version. Here, this is just a simple summary of what the differences were between the guidelines, but I won't spend too much time on that uh, at, the, at present. Okay, so we'll now get to our first case. Um, participation is welcomed by me, but you may not uh, feel comfortable, uh, so I will uh, sort of talk through the case unless somebody interrupts me. So here we have a 68-year-old gentleman who presented to hospital following a syncope at a concert. When he, once he arrived to hospital, he actually had a bradycardic arrest and eventually went on to receive a device, uh, a pacemaker. But in the context of, of his presentation, he did have an echo. Um, and this is what his echo showed. So before the echo, we knew that he'd had a bioprosthetic uh, AVR magna number 21. Um, about two years ago. So even from, okay, so even just here, we can see that there is some rocking motion that looks a bit abnormal. <laughs> and once we zoom in on the parasternal long axis view, we continue to see that rocking motion. Um, however, when we look, put some color on, we actually don't see um, too much uh, regurgitation. And it's hard, it's a bit hard on this view in any case to appreciate uh, flow acceleration. So we keep going. Once we get to our apical five chamber, we can really see that valve rocking away. And now we appreciate some uh, flow acceleration here. And we still see that there is a little bit of uh, intravalvular regurgitation, just a tiny little jet at the very sort of end of this clip. Once we put our um, uh, CW 
we obtain a mean gradient of 32 at a stroke volume of uh, 21 mils per meter squared. If we, I, if we measure the acceleration time, it's just about, just on spot, 100 uh, milliseconds. Using the continuity equation, we obtain an EOA of 0 0.4 centimeters squared and a DVI of 0 0.11. And again, we're still convinced that that uh, little regurgitation is not, not a, nothing extreme. So looking at these values here, we would think, hmm, looks like we might be dealing with a very stenotic valve. Now, looking at the contour, it's, it is still maintaining some of that uh, triangular shape, and the acceleration time is sort of in that gray zone. So what are we to do? Well, the next natural step is a TEE. And here, the, the image quality is much better. And we have this interesting finding of almost a floating valve. It's not floating. There is a large sort of um, sinusal valsalva almost aneurysm, and the valve is still attached, but just rocking away um, in that kind of dilated annulus. Color flow again confirms there is some flow acceleration and a, uh, just some, some mild uh, intravalvular regurgitation. The valve itself, the leaflets look okay and they're moving normally. Once we uh, go into our transgastric view, we are able to obtain um, a mean gradient again through um, uh, on a transesophageal echo. And this time we obtain a mean gradient of 25, a stroke volume of 58 mils per meter squared, an acceleration time again of about 100, but the EOA is one point. And this patient is, um, has a BSA of 1.6 um, and a DVI of 0.28. That's interesting. It makes us wonder, well, what is what is so different between this study and the study we just had a few days back? Certainly looking at the reference values for that particular valve, it almost seems that we are within the normal for that valve. Well, the difference here is the LVOT. So this is the LT um, we measure off a very challenging <laughs> uh, transthoracic echo. Here you actually can't even appreciate that the annulus is 4.7 centimeters, which we later measured. But here, when we stop this and in mid-systole measure the LVOT, we actually get an LVOT of 2.7. So in essence, we have the valve itself is normal. Um, yes, it's rocking, but it's rocking because of the, uh, the, the annulus being dilated, not so much because there's anything else wrong with the prosthesis. And uh, this patient was eventually discussed at um, uh, uh, heart team rounds and ultimately uh, left for monitoring. So very important to, to be mindful of all your measurements. Okay, so I'll much more quickly go through the uh, mitral valve because we now have a, a concept in mind. So everything is the same, except that your color Doppler and spectral Doppler will, an analysis will be a bit different. So here we're going to be more interested in our uh, early peak velocity. Again, the mean gradient, the heart rate, because that will change the diastolic filling time, the pressure half time, uh, the DVI. Note that the DVI equation is different uh, than and in reverse than what we had for uh, the aortic valve. Um, we'll look again at the EOA, the regurgitation, and then at sort of chamber quantification and uh, pulmonary artery pressure uh, estimation because that is relevant to the hemodynamics of the valve as well. Okay, so general normal values, uh, again, vary, vary for valve to valve but these are general guidelines that you can follow for the, that peak uh, early metro velocity. Similar to the aortic valve, the E velocity being high does not necessarily prove uh, obstruction because it can be high in hyperdynamic states, in tachycardia, if the valve is very small, uh, if there's regurgitation, 
or if you are again in that situation of a bileaflet uh, prosthesis. The pressure half time is sort of our best friend in this case. Um, uh, and for those of you who don't know much about pressure half time, it's essentially the time that it takes for your gradient to go from peak to a half. Um, we cannot use the pressure half time to calculate the EOA. We still use the continuity equation. Uh, in severe cases, um, the pressure half time, like if you have moderate to severe MS, the pressure half time is uh, quite good at kind of telling you lots about the possible uh, se like, uh, severity of obstruction. If you have only mild MS, then pressure half time can be influenced by other things such as your LVEDP. Um, so that you can't entire there are other explanations for why it might be long uh, in that in that those cases. Um, okay, a pressure half time of about one thirty milliseconds, uh, greater than one thirty milliseconds, suggests obstruction. And unless you have concomitant uh, stenosis, you, your pressure half time really should not be elevated if you have prosthetic MR. So like I said, you can't use it to calculate the EOA. You'll still use the usual um, continuity equation. Just be mindful that your, uh, you can, your stroke volume will obviously be impacted if you have AR or MR. So if they're more than mild, um, you can't entirely rely on that EOA. If the patient has atrial fibrillation, you sort of have to pick matching RR intervals for the VTIs that you're obtaining. And uh, again, if it's if just be mindful of that by leaflet uh, valve uh, and taking a central uh, orifice uh, reading. The dimensional velocity index, as I mentioned, is a slightly different uh, equation. It's useful in distinguishing uh, sort of why we have an elevated uh, velocity in high output states. It will be normal, meaning the DVI will be less than 2.2. Uh, this is the reference for mechanical valves. It's slightly different for other valves. Versus in stenosis, you will have an elevated uh, VTI um, for the prosthetic uh, uh, valve. You will um, bump up your DVI. And this, uh, by similar concept, if you have MR, your LVOT VTI will be low, and thus you'll have a high DVI. And again, match the cycles there too. This is a summary uh, the guidelines provide for the reference kind of values and cutoffs. Uh, it is most applicable to mechanical valves. The um, uh, Mayo Echo Manual uh, provides, in the fourth edition, provides, and you can find these online as well, but they provide nice algorithms for um, mechanical, pericardial mitral, and por uh, porcine uh, mitral valve. Um, kind of prostheses and how you can decide whether you're dealing with a pathologic obstruction or pathologic regurgitation, PPM or high flows. I won't go over them right now, but it's just important for you to know that those are references that you can um, use and have somewhere uh, on your desktop to sort of help you decide what uh, problem you're dealing with when you come across a high mean gradient. The cutoff for PPM in the mitral position is different from the aortic position. And uh, I've shown the cutoffs here with 0 0.9 centimeters per uh, centimeter squared per meter squared being severe. And as previously, it, it makes a, it does make an impact on both um, long-term survival and how uh, much persistent pulmonary hypertension the patient has post-procedure. This case is much more simple compared to the last case. So here we have a 60-year-old gentleman who is five months post cabbage and bio MBR, and he pre is presenting with NYHA two to three uh, dyspnea. The valve is a St. Jude Epic uh, 31. So here, when we look at this valve in the parasternal long axis view, it's not rocking. It looks like it's well positioned. But so the valve position is fine, but the leaflets look a bit thick and generous. When we put color on, we see a significant gradient. 
uh, lots of aliasing, a nice PISA here, and a little bit of uh, regurgitation. In the apical four chamber view, we see much of the same, and then we obtain a gradient that of 21 millimeters mercury at a heart rate of 79 beats per minute. So that's a very large gradient. If we were to, I did do a pressure half time, I haven't recorded it here, but it's well over 300 actually. So we're clearly dealing with something bad. And we move on to um, obtain a TEE. Now on this side, we have valve leaflets that look quite thick and they seem to have something on sort of attached to them. It doesn't seem to be as echo bright as the stent of the valve. And then this picture is actually a few, uh, about a week later, um, not a week later, sorry, a few months later, uh, once we have done an intervention. And that intervention in this case was actually just uh, initiation of anticoagulation. So most of the time we think that uh, thrombosis in bioprosthetic valves is rare, but it does happen. And uh, according to the, in keeping with the AHA guidelines, you can simply try um, anticoagulation instead of um, from uh, fibrinolysis um, and see how that works, especially if the patient is, you know, NYHA 2 or 3 and not uh, uh, 4 or in shock or anything like that. And that was the case here. So he did uh, quite well for a number of years. So we now get to the conclusions. So it's important to understand what degree of dysfunction is within the normal range for a particular prosthetic valve. It's important to have a differential in mind for high mean gradients, uh, as, as we've discussed. Uh, you can use all your uh, tools in your echo tool kit, including 2D echo, color Doppler, and spectral Doppler to help you come up with uh, a hypothesis as to why the gradient may be high. And then you can also uh, be mindful of using published uh, algorithms to help you come up with those conclusions. And lastly, uh, have a very low threshold for TEE if indeed you're not sure what's going on uh, as we do have uh, interventions uh, such as anticoagulation that can uh, help the patient along. Thank you. Thank you, Vesna. And uh, that was a very good and comprehensive review of um, the prosthetic valve uh, echo evaluation. So um, uh, now open for discussion. And uh, just a shout out to uh, some of the Canadian contribution to the uh, prosthetic mismatch. A lot of it is uh, done in uh, Laval uh, by Dr. Pivero, that uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Jeremy Nong, has, a, has the opportunity to train with him. And um, uh, a lot of the uh, mismatch was, was actually uh, came out from Canada, so it's uh, mm -hmm. very well um, um, known. <laughs> so anyway, open for discussion by my colleagues and, and uh, any questions you can put into the chat box in the remaining seven minutes. And Dr. Duminel, by, by the way, that's the other doctor I was going to mention. Dr. Jean Duminel, one of the father yes. of ECHO in Canada as well. So those two. Hi, Vesna. Hello. That was great. Uh, it's uh, Howard. Um, can one, you know, I think the um, the acceleration time, I think, you know, I think is useful. Um, I think it's more useful with regards to the shape of the spectral Doppler profile. The actual measurement, I, practically, I find a bit challenging, especially when um, at that cutoff. Um, so perhaps could you could you comment on that? And as well, I know studies have also um, uh, normalized the acceleration time to the ejection time um, because it can be affected by heart rate, for example. Yes, I did um, read about the AT over the ET uh, ratios. However, the at least the late the late the latest guidelines um, didn't actually include them. So I stuck with the AT. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, I think, but I understand the the, I guess the limitations to it. Yeah, the ET is actually much more easier to um, measure than mm -hmm. the 
um, especially if the if the profile is a bit shaggy, for example. Um, but I, I think your your point the to the shape um, kind of early peaking more round and parabolic, for example. I think that uh, yes. Indeed. Um, any any other comments? I think uh, one of um, the other comments. No... Can... Oh, Kim, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, I was just going to say, yeah, great rounds. Totally agree with what Howard said. I I think we've all struggled with this. Maybe not for the um, acceleration time so much for prosthetic valves, but also the pulmonary artery acceleration time, which is a bit of a, a another one which is difficult to measure. So I think they're in the same grade, and we should do them off the CW. Um, but like all these measurements, you need to actually spend a lot of time to get a nice Doppler profile. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of those things, I think, uh, looking at the valve, just the 2D appearance and taking the measurements and then understanding that if they're I think Kim dropped off. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was going to make a quick comment, um, you know, about the uh, parameters that uh, we now uh, have to report for prosthetic aortic valve. So uh, I think the, the the thing, the minimum that we have to do is the mean gradient. Um, uh, and then also, I, I think, you know, we've also favor reporting the DVI. If, if the uh, uh, velocity, and then we do need to be quite rigorous about taking the measurements because they'll come up with an erroneous screening. So Kim is coming in and out. We'll, we'll have to get him the 5G phone. <laughs> so I wait for him to come back up. So, um, you know, minimum of uh, the mean gradient and the DVI peak gradient and the VMAX uh, will be useful as well. And uh, the EOA has always been interesting to me because I think they're highly variable. So we, we do incorporate them, but I, I personally don't put as much uh, uh, value to them because of the challenge of LVOT. Although one of the arguments is that you can continue to use the LVOT um, on, on the really good uh, one that you can see uh, when you can't see them well. So you measure like 18 millimeter or 20 millimeter before and just stick with it so that there's a less variation in that area. Okay, maybe Kim will be back. <laughs> Actually, while, while Kim is hopefully reconnecting, um, uh, if I can follow up Chiming on the EOA, it, it it it's kind of gone back and forth. I remember when it, when when I first started practice with you, we were we were in the realm of not ever reporting an EOA or a valve area, right. prosthetic valves, and then with the prosthetic mismatch um, from Dumanil and Pivaro, it became the norm where we would do EOA routinely, recognizing the the challenges and the limitations. Um, that's the, I guess in the most recent guideline, do they suggest reporting EOA or or not um, reporting? I tend to continue to do so, recognizing the the challenges, especially with the um, the LVOT diameter uh, measurements, <laughs> which is always challenging, um, uh, uh, and the variability from study to study, uh, in part because of the the varying LVOT dimensions. Do okay. they? How important is the EOA measurement? I think the greatest, obviously, the most important. But in the spectrum of reporting, what's your sense on EOA? I think for the, in order for, I think it is a part of a, the complete report because it helps you comment on at least PPM. Although I have noticed that even when we report, sometimes you do get an EOA that's like you know 0.7. And we often don't index DOA, but we often don't um, make a comment about it kind of being PPM. So I guess I'm putting it, the, the guidelines themselves sort of say to include it as a val, like in your report without weighing in what's more and what's less important. But I'm just wondering as a group, um, why we it, it is the reason we don't comment on it sometimes because we are uh, mindful of the limitations of the measurements I, I think we all have slightly different reasons for not rep i tend to i probably report more than most in all honesty um but i'm very careful about when 
the EOA is less than or equal to one. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think there is significant prosthetic um, valve stenosis. Um, mm -hmm. Your point about checking for patient prosthesis mismatch, I think, is is really important knowing the, the characteristics of the valve that, that you're examining. Um, because you calculate uh, patient prosthesis mismatch really without any any gradients per se, right? It's just really just mm -hmm. the expected valve area and the, the yeah. Gap. So. But isn't that the issue, uh, Howard? The you know the you have to be mindful of the valve that's in there, right? So if it's all you know a number a nineteen, you know a small valve versus a large valve. So you know yeah. that the body surface if, area. Or, so yes. if the expected valve area is actually small, then you know you're less fussed than if it's actually a large valve. So with that in mind now is uh, 901, and thank you very much everyone for the participation, the comment. Thank you, Vasner, for uh, doing this very comprehensive review. And uh, with that, we'll sign off and uh, wait for another exciting episode next Thursday morning. So thank, thank you. you.